excellent. Um, uh, my name is Maria Bernier. I am the state data coordinator and construction grant administrator for the Connecticut State Library. My pronouns are she and hers. And we're here today to talk about library design and specifically working within the space that you have. We have two presenters today. Karen Goodell became the director of the Beardsley Library, serving the towns of Barkhampstead, Colebrook and Winchester in 2011. Prior to that, she served as the head of children and youth services at Beardsley for four years. In her 10 years as director, the library has undergone renovation, repurposing and reinvention of every room in the 123 year old building. Thank you, Karen. And Kate Byrode has been the director of the Craig and Memorial Library for over 11 years. She previously worked in West Hartford, Glastonbury, Portland, Bethel, and Manchester. In those work experiences, she's worked in buildings that are now as old as 179 years and as new as 19 years. So we have a breadth of library building experience here with us today in the room. Um, and I'm sure that you all have much experience in your own libraries and the places you've worked. So we have a lot of context to work with and I'm sure we'll have some great questions as we go along the way. So Karen, I'm gonna turn this over to you. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so that you can share your presentation and we will get started with you. All right, bear with me here while I... Uh, why is this not working? There we go. Can everybody see that now? Looking good. All right. Well, thank you all for coming to the presentation today and for your interest in this topic, which I think is something um, particularly important to those of us that work in a small um, and more rural libraries as we try to work with spaces that are not necessarily conducive to the needs of our more modern communities um, as they've evolved over time. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what we've been through at Beardsley um, and how we've learned lots of lessons along the way about how to maximize the use of this 123 year old building. Um, and we have actually been able to do this over time without really having to undertake major construction projects or uh, seek major sources of funding the way that we've worked it. Um, so let's get started here. Um, first of all, I'm going to show you a little comparison of what the library used to look like and what it looks like now, which is actually not much different, as you can see. Um, a whole lot has not been done to the exterior of this building. Um, there was an addition put on the back, which you can't see in this photo back in the 1990s, that just created some more accessibility, um, some more office space, and a little bit more room for some of our collections. Um, there was a basement renovation done to make that space a program space, and again, to add some more office space. But beyond that, there really has not been a whole lot of um, uh, construction done on the building. We were able to get a construction grant several years ago to expand our parking lot, which was really useful. So when I... Uh, came into my position as director, one of the things that was a really big challenge for me was how to take the interior of this building, which really had not been updated in a long time, um, and make it feel less tired and cluttered, I guess, because that's kind of where it was at that point. Um, didn't seem particularly inviting when people came in the way that it was laid out, um, hadn't been updated in quite some time. So, what we did over the first several years uh, was really to focus on more aesthetic um, issues with the building. So the next few slides, I'm going to show you some before and after of our um, some of the rooms that we renovated at first. Um, and we updated things such as uh, paint, carpet, window, um, you know, window trimmings and that kind of thing, just to make it look fresher. We changed out some of the furniture. You can see 
sort of on the side of the screen of the before picture of our children's room. We had really tall shelves that were completely full and blocked your view in the room. So we, you know, changed it to some lower shelving, more accessible for children, made it a little bit more open and inviting that way. Um, same thing in our teen room. Our teen room seemed to be the place where a lot of things landed that nobody wanted anymore, like these study carols that the computers are in and some random furniture and that kind of thing. So we were able to uh, do a couple of fundraisers and again, update the, the paint and the carpet and put in some new furniture and give it a, a fresher look for our teens. Um, and then in our, uh, our main reading room, um, we did again that concept of less is more. We started to take out some of the furniture and then uh, updated again the paint. Um, we uh, this summer with some of the funds that we received through the uh, pandemic relief grants and things, we were able to put in some um, you know some of these clear barriers between the computers to make the uh, um, the room more friendly during the pandemic. Um, but we had already been really going with that notion that less is more. Um, Again, here's another room, our genealogy room, taking out shelves, rearranging things, updating the paint. Um, that's That was a lot of the focus for the first several years. So with all of those changes that we made, it was great. And the library really did become a much busier place. And we noticed a big change in our usage of the library and our um, circulation and everything. And, it became so busy, in fact, that it began became a problem. Like so many people want to use our library now. It really became the community center for our community, but we just did not have the space to accommodate all of those needs. Um, so finding space to, you know, move around and arrange to, you know, host different groups and activities at the library was very, very tricky. Um, but we knew we needed to make a change. So we started to brainstorm and uh, brainstorm and contemplate what we could do. And what we landed on was this room that we called our biography room, which is downstairs in the basement, back in the corner. Um, the arrow that I have there is pointing, there used to be a big tall shelf there that was loaded with books. This is after we actually started to make some changes in the room. Um, and we thought, well, this space we could probably use for something. You know, we could put a table in there and, you know, maybe have a quiet study space. Uh, but we thought that we really would have to do more. We weren't quite sure what that was. Um, but what we really focused on at that point was weeding. So I want to take a minute here to sort of stress the importance of weeding, how it became really important to us to be able to move more of that collection um, by weeding it weeding some area, other areas of the library to move the biographies to. And it actually, in the end, was a win-win because the bi biographies were in an area where people could actually browse them and we didn't have to point people, oh, well, you have to go down to the basement and around the corner and in the back room. And people were like, what? So now, you know, the biographies were in a place uh, where people could actually find them. Um, and it was right about that time where we were making all of these changes that I was on a listserv and I found out about the um, this grant program called Small Libraries Create Smart Spaces that was being offered through uh, Web Junction um, part, and it was also through OCLC, IMLS and um, the Association for Rural and Small Libraries. Um, so I thought, you know, I read about what they were doing about helping libraries transform and redesign exi existing spaces. So I said, hey, I'm going to apply for that. I did. And luckily, we were one of 15 libraries in the country that were chosen to participate in the program. So that was exciting. Um, and it involved a $5,000 grant, which, as we know, probably does not go a long way towards renovation, but it was a starting point. Um, but the main thing that it really involved was a lot of um, professional de development and training for us in the use of design thinking and using a more human-centered approach to how we um, planned for our, our spaces. Uh, one of the most 
critical parts for us that we found the most useful was in this process of um, community discovery. And really we spent a few months working on this um, with the help of the consultants through um, Web Junction and networking with the other libraries that were part of the program. Um, and it really was about us getting out into the community and uh, finding out what people really wanted um, in a lot of different ways. Uh, in the photo here where we um, approached this lovely dog, <laughs> We were actually at an event, a public event that we have in our town. There's a thing called the Pet Parade, and it's one of the biggest events that we have. So we went there and we brought our little uh, mobile suggestion box with us. We had a float in the parade and we walked around and just talked to people. And it was so great because it was people that were not necessarily coming to the library, but they said, hey, well, we would love to do this or that, or this is something that we value or we would like to see in our town. And we took all of that information, our children's library, and did a similar thing in the schools. We did have some, um, some things set up in the library to get feedback from people. And this was way beyond just like traditional surveys. And um, at the end of the presentation, I'm, I'm actually going to put a link to share for a, um, it's a toolkit and it has a bunch of ideas for how you can do this process for um, using a design thinking approach in libraries. Um, so after we gathered all of that information, um, the next step was to take all of that information and just lay it all out there and think about, okay, this is what people want or this is what people value. Um, and we wanted at this point also to involve as many stakeholders as possible in, in this next step. Like, what could we do to meet these goals? Like, how could we use this space to, um, to help, you know, facilitate these uh, needs that people have in the community? Um, so we invited our board members, we invited friends of the library, we invited people that were already using the library, uh, we talked to some uh, town leaders and got input from them, um, just some patrons. Hey, what do you think about this? Uh, the key is to involve as many voices as possible so that you can address um, the bigger picture. And it's not just, well, if we build it, they will, you know, they'll come here. It's more about this is what they want and now let's build it. So we did that. We went through that process and we started to identify some sort of themes. We needed a really flexible space. We needed a, a space that was very organized, um, some place that invited social interaction. It had to be set up for technology because there was a big need in our community for um, training and um, for uh, you know uh, digital literacy and job searching and that kind of thing was a big need in our community. So, you know, this space really had to be adaptable um, as much as possible. We were thinking, you know, things have to be on wheels. We have to be able to fold up tables, push them aside. Uh, we have to be able to um, uh, have, you know, the technology needed. Like uh, we have a screen that just, you know, we can raise and lower um, uh, projectors, computers that are accessible, that kind of thing, but that can be packed away and, you know, set aside for when we're having big, um, you know, arts and crafts projects or something like that. So flexibility was key. Uh, the next phase in the process for the uh, Smart Spaces project was this idea of prototyping. And this is a really important uh, point that a lot of people like to leave out but especially when you're dealing with tricky spaces um, and small spaces such as we were, uh, this really helped us a lot, creating some prototypes so that we can see if our idea was gonna work in the space that we had. And we even had some of our um, teen volunteers create sort of um, two scale paper cutouts of furniture so we could lay it out in the room to say, oh, well, we thought we were gonna only get six tables, but hey, we can fit eight still comfortably. And we made some decisions based on that. Um, again, we got input from a lot of people. In one of the photos here, you see a couple of our regular library users that come to um, participate in a knitting program. So they wanted a comfy space where they could hang out and, and do their knitting program. And so they gave us some input about some things that might be useful to them in the room. Um, 
So we did, we did the prototyping. And then came the really fun part where we got to put it all together. And again, this was so much about involving the community as much as possible. It was a big push through the, um, the uh, Smart Spaces project. So we enlisted the friends of the library to help unpacking all of the boxes. And we got some of our teen volunteers to, to paint the walls and um, you know set up the furniture. And, and it really felt great to involve as much of the community as possible in this. Um, but that's where we came back to this original idea of, well, we only had $5,000 <laughs> and everything we wanted to do really involved uh, you know, the, the need for some more funding. But because we had already been out in the community so much and talking about this and pushing it, we were already um, sort of set up to go and approach different local businesses and the local banks. And our friends of the library were actively involved in the whole process. So they knew what we were doing and they understood what we were doing and they were very willing to support us, which was great. Um, we received some um, very nice donations from the bank, from one of the local industries, from our friends of the library, and then just some private donors actually donated. We originally were going to have a fundraising event for the project, but um, that was put on hold due to COVID and we were never able to have it, but it was nice that we got these other donations. Um, so what we ended with was this room which is exactly what we wanted it, it it was it looked nice it was very functional it was very flexible um but also part of this design thinking process is that you have to constantly be reevaluating your needs um so as we went along we sort of got a lot of feedback from the people that were beginning to use the room like what did you like about this what did you like about that we had conversations with them we had some evaluation forms so if we needed to change anything um, or readjust the way we were doing things or add some things. Um, you know, it's a, a constant cycle of, of feedback and, and, and updating. So um, this uh, shows you a little bit of our ideas and action. Right, right as we were finishing up the project was when COVID hit and we ended up having to close down for for uh you know 15 weeks but um but we did we were able to get our champs after school program in there and that's who you can see in the picture working on one of their steam projects um so our tables that we were able to move around were really good for faci facilitating active learning with the children and um it was very hands-on uh after we reopened, uh, we were able to set up by appointment for people to use the room, which they found incredibly helpful for families that were homeschooling, for people that needed um, a space where that they could work in a quiet space. So, you know, the room did get utilized um, during the pandemic and slowly but surely we're building it back up to what we originally um, thought and, and felt that the room would become. Um, so basically that's, that's my spiel. I don't know if there's any questions about what we went through or about this whole process of using design thinking to re, uh, revitalize your space, but I'm open to. I invite everybody, go ahead and type your questions in the chat for Karen. Um, and I'm gonna start with a question while you guys are thinking, so type away. But Karen, my question is about that concept of um, feedback and ongoing changes from your community members. And I'm curious about what kind of things they told you and, and what their requests were and how and whether you were able to respond to those. Yeah, um, we, uh, we did get some feedback. Um, some of it also was from our staff about um, you know, how it was working for them in terms of, you know, having people sign up and then having to go and disinfect the space and how we should, you know, change the way we were scheduling this, the use of the space. Um, people did ask us for more, uh, for the possibility of more um, activities planned in there that were uh, 
I guess, more techie, like coding, robotics, that type of thing. So we had um, a lot of the input we got was about arts and crafts. So we really set it up to be very heavy on, you know, the drop in arts and crafts type programs. But we, we got some requests to kind of kick it up a notch. We were able to get a 3D printer, um, which we have not been able to start any programming with yet. But so that that's kind of the the feedback that we got at this point. <laughs> Let's see. Ooh. I was going to try to get the link. Oh, I can't hear you, Maria. You're muted, Maria. Well, I will jump in then. Hello, all. <laughs> I'm Ashley. I'm Maria's backup. So um, there are actually a few questions in here, Karen. So I'm just going to tackle them one at a time. Um, okay. Can you speak a little bit about ADA compliance in your renovations? Sure. We, um, you know, we did. Um, accommodate for that. The, the room was already ADA accessible. Um, so when we were thinking about the furnishings and the types of things we would be using, we wanted to um, make sure that that was part of the design process. And, and through, the, the, through the project, they gave us some tools to facilitate that. That's great. Thank you. Um, were there any issues using volunteers versus your custodial or maintenance staff? And do you have a union at your library? Kind of related questions there. No, we do not have a union. We are a um, library association, so we're a separate 501c3. We don't have a union. And our volunteers are all covered through our liability insurance, so that wasn't an issue. That's great. Mm -hmm. um, next question. Um, how did this space impact your current and future staffing needs? Hmm. So far, uh, it hasn't really, you know, the people that sort of focus on programming are still focused on programming and, and they utilize the room for their programming um, needs at this point. Um, we had enough staff that we were able to, as I mentioned earlier, the whole idea of scheduling and, and disinfecting the room and kind of keeping it up that way. We haven't, that hasn't become an issue for us at this point. Um, so, as I said, we're sort of slowly but surely uh, hoping that the room will realize its full potential and we'll see how it goes from there. But. So far, there really have not been issues with keeping the room staff and, and keeping it disinfected and keeping it restocked and yeah, kind of thing. So well, and it sounds like it's at this point built into your process of constantly thinking about it, evaluating, and making a change if you if you so need to. So that's yeah. great. Um, if others have questions, please drop them on in. That's the end of the list for now. So uh, perhaps with that, I will turn it over to you, Kate. Hi everyone. Um, let me get my presentation. Um, you want to give me the ability to share? I think you should have it. Is it not popping up for you? Okay, I just have to look. Sorry. Uh, no worries. Share screen. There it is. There it is. Okay. Excellent. All right. And I'll put it on. Okay. Perfect. So, um, so I have a different um, situation um, than Karen. Karen has an old building that's had only minor, um, uh, minor additional construction, and I have a even at 19 years old, um, practically brand new building. Um, so people will say to me, "Well, 
how could that be a problem? <laughs> and it's, it's not really a problem, but one of, one of the things I really want to emphasize um, as we're talking is that um, being able to look at your spaces with new eyes, um, repurposing things, swapping things around, um, bringing in um, new equipment, um, moving furniture, um, is very, very important. So um, I, that's why I titled this, How a New Library is Like Marrying Steve Rogers, where even perfection can be improved. Um, so um, my foundations for thinking this way, um, I can trace to uh, my, um, you know, I was one of those kids who always reorganized my room, moved my bed around, moved my bookcases around. I did that, I did that in college. I did that in our apartments. Um, but the, um, the real foundations were, um, the real foundations were, uh, for this kind of thinking was, um, this book that I highly recommend, How Buildings Learn, What Happens After They're Built by Stuart Brand. Um, it's a really fascinating book, just loaded with pictures. It's available in libraries. Um, and I recommend it to anybody. It's just sort of a good way to start thinking about spaces and how things can change over time. Um, Jay Lucker, who some of you may have known, um, had been the director of libraries at MIT, and then he worked as a building consultant in his retirement. Um, and I was fortunate enough that he was a lecturer at Simmons when I was um, going through my master's program. And he taught a course in library architecture and design um, and he gave us some, some real truisms, you know, one of which is the librarian's job. If you're, if you're lucky to have a construction project, one of the librarian's jobs is to uh, rein in the ambitions of the architect because architects love to build libraries. <laughs> they love to put in soaring spaces because these, they know that these are meaningful buildings in communities and it's a real place for them to sort of show off and to do grand and exciting things. Um, so it's not that you wanna end up with a dull and boring library. It's just that you have to kind of, you know, be realistic um, and make sure that your architect, or architect stays realistic. Um, and then my husband's uncle, Brian, who it's one of those things, my, uh, he's the youngest uncle is only a few years older than the oldest grandchild. So um, he was an architect at Tepe and Associates. Um, that does a lot of schools and libraries in New England. Um, and um, I actually stayed with um, him and his wife while I was in library school a couple of nights a week. And he was working on one project and then moved to another project. So I got to see those projects and other projects. So we had a number of field trips. Um, so I was very lucky to have that sort of background. And then I had worked at a bunch of different libraries. I started working in libraries when I was 16 at the West Hartford Public Library as a page. And then I worked in my college library. And then after college, I worked at Wells Turner Library in Glastonbury. I worked at the Portland Library, the Bethel Library before the addition. I was there when we were planning it. And as the teen librarian there, I you know, said, this is what we need in our teen space. Um, I was in Manchester, um, both at the Ma Mary Cheney Library, the mothership, and then at the White and Branch. Um, and then I was lucky enough to come to Colchester um, at the end of 2009. And I had this seven year old building that's really beautiful. And it was like, it was like Captain America. It was amazing. It was wonderful. And it gives me joy every day. So that's my, that's my um, genesis. The original building was completed in 1905. Um, it was the gift of Dr. Edward Cragen, who grew up in town. Um, it was built in memory of his father, Mr. Edward Cragen. The original building was 4,000 square feet, and there was a plan that the basement would serve the men and boys of Colchester as a gymnasium, but it seems that that either never happened or was very short-lived. Um, I don't really know how they could have done it because it's it's not, I don't think it's a full eight feet down downstairs. So here is Steve Rogers before he bulked up with his transformation. And here's the 1905 part of the building. Um, and it was very small and very wimpy. Um, there had been 97 years 
um, between the original construction and the new building. And the library had been too small for the community for at least 30 of them. Um, Colchester had, um, had a spurt of development in the post-war era. And then from 1996 to 2006, it was the fastest growing town in Connecticut. Um, so the library was built right in the middle of that time. Um, the construction of the new library had been a huge relief to the staff. All of their issues and all of their problems had been solved, right? I know. <laughs> And so here's Steve Rogers transforming into Captain America. Here's the building under construction um, from late 2001. You can see the superstructure, the beams. Um, I don't have any clearer image than this one. Um, so the building went from 4,000 square feet to 20,000 square feet, quintupling in size. Um, and a couple of years ago in the winter time, they were doing work on the belfry of the church across the street and got some pictures and I, they were sent over to me. And so now you can have the, the bird's eye view of the library. Isn't it fabulous? Um, it's so beautiful. It's so perfect. It just, it's, you know, you come to my library, like what problems could you possibly have? Well, um, here's, I wanted to sh show you the floor plans uh, for the library. This is the upper level floor plan. Um, this is the adult and teen area. So I just want to point out some specifics. So this square over here, everybody can see my mouse moving, right? Okay, great. Um, this is a 1905 part of the building. So we have a reading room and a reading room. Um, my office, AV, and two restrooms in the 1905 um, footprint. And then in the 2002 um, edition, we have the reference collection, a quiet study, public computers, a reference desk, circulation area. This was the teen area, and you'll see pictures of this area in a little bit, um, the nonfiction stacks and fiction stacks. Very nice. Um, we have public computers and a copier and all of that wonderful stuff in a little cafe area. In the lower level, this is our large programming space. Uh, and then this whole thing is the children's department. Um, and I just want to call your attention right here to the nest, which was the um, computer area for, for the children's department. And I'll talk about the changes there later in this program. And then this is the story time room. Um, as you can see, it's a fully interior um, room, so there's no natural light in there, um, but it does have these nice double doors, and I'll talk about that room in particular. And then this is the basement of the 1905 building that was originally the gym for the men and boys um, of Colchester, and we have our offices and work rooms, and this layout is a little bit different than what it actually is, but we have our staff room down here, um, our general work area um cataloging offices that that sort of thing um so what i'm talking about here today are continuous changes over time much like captain america's uniform um, and i want to talk to you about my two most important tools in any of these changes um, number one is fat max uh, which is my measuring tape because anytime we start talking about making a change i pull out my um, trusty um, measuring tape. Um, and if you're not yet a library director and you become one, you go out and get one of these your first day on the job, okay? Because you need this all the time. And you don't let anyone ever take it away from you. It lives in your desk drawer. Um, and then over here is Roland, our custodian, who does not like to pose for pictures at all. So I just got him on the fly. Um, but Roland is a creative mechanical genius. And he and I will start having conversations or another staff member will say, oh, I want to make this happen. And Roland and I come in and we consult about it and he figures out how to make it happen. So a lot of the things that I've been able to do here have been because of Roland. Um, and I can't emphasize enough just the value of this person who's willing to tinker and try with anything. Um, so hey, there were jump? changes. Yep. Can I jump in with one question as they're popping in? Sure. Um, 
How many people can your meeting space hold? And so I think you our, had a couple. Yeah, so our, our largest meeting room can have 80, 80 seated. Um, but I had the fire marshal come in and I said, well, what if I don't have chairs? What if I just have kids in for a performance sitting with their little butts on the floor? And um, that number is 147. Um, which is really nice. So when we do our big summer programs in the, in the, well, when we did them in the before times, uh, we cleared out all the chairs and we maybe had a, a, a row or two at the very back of the space uh, for people who really needed to sit. But children, you know, programs really aimed at children. We had the children sit on the carpeted floor. And so that's the maximum attendance allowed by the fire marshal. Um, we, our story time room is similar. Um, it's 47. You know, if you, if you take out all the chairs, 47 people can be in there, which it's not that big a room. Um, and our other meeting rooms have a capacity of, uh, with the furniture that's in place, about 20. Um, but again, if we take out chairs or we do different configurations, I can get as many as 30 or 40 people and the fire marshal's okay. It really depends on the setup and he's gone through that with me. So that's always worth a conversation with your local fire marshal um, because they, um, an auditorium use is more restrictive and has a lower head count. Um, but if you don't have chairs, um, for some, re for some reason, or you're doing a different kind of setup, um, you can have more capacity. So that's a, that's a very worthwhile conversation and one I'm glad I had early on. Is there another question? Uh, that's it at the moment. Okay, so um, changes began right away. One of the very first changes at the library was the lighting upstairs. These are the, this is one of those architectural photos that was taken right at the end of construction. Um, you'll see over here, there are spotlights aimed up at the ceiling. And it was decided fairly quickly that this was really inadequate lighting at night. So they put in this tray lighting. So these are all fluorescent um, tubes in here. Um, and they're, they are hidden from view, you can't see them. And we do have very good lighting at night. Um, and then they also added these lovely, um, uh, lamps to the tables, to the study tables that just are, they're very elegant. Um, this area is our new book area. And I just wanted to uh, show it to you um, as our new book area. The change was made before I came here, but it was originally the teen area. And what I want to point out to you is that um, if you'll recall the schematic that I showed you, you know that this is where the teen room the teen area was originally located. It's right at the top of the stairs, directly across from both the reference and circulation desks. It was a complete nightmare. Kids couldn't just hang out and goof around. Adults overreacted to everything that they did. Longtime employees tell me that it was a very difficult time at the library. Fortunately, in 2007, a new staff member had the good idea to move the teens into a new space and create, create this new attractive new book area. So what they did is back in the 1905 part of the building, there are these two identical reading room spaces, one of which um, is to the south and this, it was set up as the teen room. Um, it was a set up, it worked pretty well. And you can see there were all the computers here for the kids. Um, they had selected the room because it had doors and therefore any noise could be contained. Unfortunately, there was no line of sight for staff um, and there's no dedicated teen librarian um, position here or person. We really just don't have the staffing for somebody to just be in there every day after school. Um, it just meant that with those doors closed, there could be chaos unchecked um, and sometimes that happened. So they had to have the doors propped open all the time. And if the doors closed, they had to go be open. So they had to be supervised by the, the staff listening. Um, by the time I arrived late in 2009, the doors were propped open all the time just so staff could keep an ear on things. 
And then in very early 2000, in January of 2002, we did a, a room swap. Fortunately, those two reading rooms are essentially identical. So it's easy to swap the furniture. This is the North reading room envisioned as a quiet reading room in 2002, had become the library's boardroom in 2007 when the teens had moved into the other room and then became the teen room in 2002. So this is the teen room before, and then it was transformed back into a boardroom. And this is the teen room today. Um, what we've done is we have created, uh, you'll notice all this dark wooden shelving. This is the original shelving from 1905 that's been repurposed over time and rebuilt. It was originally stacks in the, um, in the building and Roland, our custodian, has created all of these bookshelves and put them in place. Um, they are anchored to the walls properly. Um, there is no longer any additional room in the teen room. Um, we've moved our teen books up, tween collection up here. Um, and we even have some overflow for our new books for the teen department. So it just keeps growing. Um, when I got here, um, the thing that puzzled me the most was our children's room. It was dead. <laughs> Nothing was happening in here. And there were some reasons for that. Some of them were staffing related, but also um, all story times were carried out in that large program room that um, you asked me about, like what the capacity of that room was. And all story times were drop in and they were not using the story time room. So it was possible for a family to come in for a, a program, visit the library and leave the library without ever laying eyes on a book or the collections or anything wonderful about the library. Just go into this program space, go in, get out, leave. It was not good. Um, when you came into the children's department, uh, there was this display case that's an old display case uh, pushed up against this column. Uh, when you came in, you couldn't see any books at all. So within a few short months, um, I was talking to Roland, I was envisioning that he would build, you know, something with, you know, carpentry around this column. And he came up with this idea of metal bands. And then, you know, the, the book racks that will hook onto things. Um, he, he created this metal strapping around the column and we hooked the book displayers on it and it's been new books. The paint job was done by a member of the trustees who's an accomplished artist. Um, and then we were able to take some other shelving and put it, this is right here to the left are the entry doors into the children's department. Um, there was nothing over here. It was just a blank wall. People were walking in. They could not see that we had wonderful new books ready for them. So we created this new book area to show off our collection. Um, I mentioned the story time room. And the story time room when I got here, um, so when the building was done, the story time room was painted, you know, basic beige. Um, and then they had updated them to this great, this purple color and then they put in this accent um, stripe on at the top of the chair rail of this sort of orangey red and then this you know lime green um, and so the room felt very dark to me um, and uh, this map over here is the floor plan of the story time room um, and the carpeting went about a third of the way into the room but it was very awkward um, you can't get very many little bodies onto this um, strip of carpet. And, um, and then the rest of the room were these three heavy, low tables like you would have in a preschool, um, but they weren't flexible because they probably weighed um, 100 pounds each. And then there were um, uh, eight little chairs around each table. And there was a sink in the corner, which is great. And I have a background, I worked for a while in a um, child care center and I was familiar with NAIC accreditation standards and chairs are not developmentally appropriate, really. Children can stand at low tables, um, they do better. Um, 
chairs invite them to wiggle and to fall and to um, struggle. Um, so it's just better to give them uh, a place to stand and they do very well. They don't, they're not weak adults who are used to sitting all day. Um, so we did a transformation. And so these are the old tables here. Um, we have, we changed the palette of the room. We went to a pale green, a sunny yellow and a nice bright blue sky color. Uh, we kept the sink in the corner, of course, and we re-carpeted the entire room so that children could sit comfortably in the room on the floor. Um, in the before times on Fridays, we had drop-in at the sensory table. So this is a, this is a Friday um, setup. And it is a flexible, inviting space. Eventually, we replaced those uh, heavy tables with these lightweight um, tables that are about four feet long. Um, the, they are so lightweight that the children can help us move them, which they enjoy doing. So if we have a program that ends in a craft, uh, they can help us pull them out into the middle of the room. Um, and we can easily fold them out, fold them up and take them out of the way. Um, it's very flexible for us. Um, I mentioned the computer nest when I showed you the map and um, it's hard to get a really good, you know, you think you take pictures of things before you make changes and then you find that you didn't really. So the, the computer nest was six feet by 11 feet and wrapped around this column that you see here. And it was designed, you know, the building was completed in 2002. So it was designed in roughly 2000 originally. Well, what were computers like in 2000? We had these massive CRT monitors, right? That were, you know, needed a lot of space. And then we had the, these massive CPU um, towers, which were stored below. And so you needed a lot of room. And I think the idea was we're gonna have a modern library with lots of technology and we're gonna have technology for the children. Isn't it wonderful? But again, when you walked into the children's space, all you saw was these computers sitting there. You didn't see the children's collection. Um, you didn't see the, uh, the play area. You didn't see the story time room. It was just, um, you know, oh, we have computers. Well, that's great, but that's not all that a library is. Um, and by the end of 2000, um, by the end of the 2000s, you know, monitors had slimmed down, um, CPUs were tiny, and um, it was time for a change. Um, so here's more of the computer nest. And I call it the computer nest because that's what the, there used to be wording on this column that showed a mommy computer and a nest of little baby computers in the nest. And it had wording, computer nest. It was, again, I don't have a picture of that. Um, so we made a couple of changes in between, but we were still kind of struggling what to do with that column in the middle and what to do around it. Um, we'd moved the public computers and then, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't great. And then um, Sue Smeda was the director in, at the Southington Library. Um, they had built, had had this kiosk custom built for the Southington Library. And by 2015 or so, it just was out of date. Um, it just did not suit uh, uh, the library. It was taking up too much floor space. They wanted to uh, re do their new book area. And so Sue put it out on contact and I showed it to Roland and he said, oh yeah, we got to get that Katie. <laughs> so we went to um, Southington and we brought it home and Roland worked on it for about three weeks, um, took off the roof of it, the cupola and repainted it and moved um, these, uh, these sides up a little bit to table height. And that became our new computer area for, ch for the children's department. And it's warm, it matches our coloring. Um, so it's really great. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, how do I go backwards? Um, sorry, I skipped ahead. Um, there we go, yes, train table. We got a new, um, Sorry, the controls. Uh, we got a new train table 
Um, this is a classic Melissa and Doug train table. It was, it was frankly gross and breaking and terrible and overused. And that's because this Melissa and Doug builds it out of particle board for a family that's going to use it up in, you know, five, six years um, if they have two kids. And we had an Eagle Scout who needed a project. And I said, well, could you build us a nice train table out of hardwood? And um, he and his troop did. And this is them when they brought it and presented it to us. Um, and sadly, it is locked away right now because of COVID. But it is a double train table because they raised so much money and has a little bridge that goes over. It's fabulous. And this is the really the heartbeat of our children's play area. We've taken in a lot of cast offs, people post things to contact. Um, this came from one library. Sadly, we did not get the lamp, but we got the table and we put it in our redesigned um, audio visual area. And it was our community puzzle um, table in the before times. And then um, since COVID, we couldn't have a community puzzle because people would breathe on each other. Um, so we've made it a, a display table and that's working well. Um, our reference area, um, we've, we've pretty much removed most of our reference collection. A lot of it has gone into either the circulating collection or it's just so out of date um, and unneeded that we've removed it. And this is now where all of our audiobooks and our CDs and our reference, uh, our remaining ready reference collection is, and our graphic novels uh, live here too. Uh, the reference shelving, um, graphic novels and manga, and we have extra over, overflow space for that. And well, that's when we first did it. Now they're, now they're pretty full. Um, and I'd like to show some recent changes um, downstairs. Um, the offices had awkward furniture, things that were never meant to be furniture. So this is my adult service librarian's office. And she had this, you know, farmer's table and a bookcase. And it was not very ergonomic. And it was kind of awkward in the space and could only fit one or two ways. And um, Library Connection was leaving its office, our consortium was leaving its offices and said, hey, you can come take our furniture away. And Roland and I went and grabbed it and we got this nice um, steel case uh, furniture. It's much more efficient. So this is the office today. Uh, the staff workroom had a hodgepodge of desks for people. You could see this rather terrible desk, this rather terrible chair from probably the 50s. Um, and this other desk and chair. And now we have these two, um, two uh, semi cubicles and the staff members are happy. These are part-time people. So they just need a landing spot, a place where they can work for the hour or so they get off desk when they work. Um, so those are, those are recent changes. Um, I'm happy to provide tours to visitors. There's a lot of other changes that have happened here in the years. Um, a lot of it has been dependent on um, our creativity, um, our willingness to change things around and the flexibility of the space. And um, I think it's going to allow us um, to use the library uh, more in a better way for the community over time um, and, and extend the life of this 2002 building. Um, probably longer than it was planned for. And I'm happy to answer questions. Super. Thank you, Kate. And I invite everybody to type your questions in the chat box for Kate. I, I do um, want to ask you something while people are thinking and typing. It seems to me like you really had the advantage of fresh eyes and a new perspective when you walked into your building and you could sort of look at things a little bit differently. Um, maybe watch patron behavior, maybe really see the space in a different way than people who've been working there for a while. And I'd let, hope that you could tell us a little bit about the value of those fresh eyes or um, listening to what people tell you or listening yeah. to what the patrons tell you and how that influences yeah. what you did. Um, so th there have been several changes that have been due to fresh, different fresh eyes. Um, I mentioned before that the original move of the teen room out of that really awkward area 
um, was because a staff member came on board in 2007 and said, you know, this is terrible. Everybody's unhappy. Nothing is working. And, you know, and then the flexibility. So my predecessor was, in, was also very willing to be flexible and say, yeah, you're right. And that's a good idea. Um, and then we made the change again when we saw that this was not, you know, when I came in and my office is very close and very close to that area. And I knew that I couldn't look at the kids um, from my office just across the way because of, you know, my door and the bookcase that's in between. And, you know, I just knew it was terrible. Whereas um, the way our CERC desk is, there's actually a really great line of sight that encompasses most of the teen room, the new teen room as we have it. Um, so that, so that was fresh eyes. Um, I just hired a new adult services librarian and she's already um, made some changes. So we've, I didn't put these in, but we've just moved that manga and, and um, graphic novel collection um, to, in our new book area, we had sort of a power wall where we had staff picks and our board games and um, some other, um, like a special display. And we've moved all our graphic novels and uh, manga over there where they have room to grow. And we've put our board games where they used to be. And we've come up with a couple of new um, staff display area, you know, book display areas. And so it's really helpful to get those, those fresh um, new employee eyes, but also seeing how people are use, actually using the space, um, going out, walking around. Um, I noticed that, um, I noticed that people really liked um, a really small inadequate table that's, um, there's a place where the 1905 building juts into the 2002 building. It's literally the corner of the building um, comes in and there was a very small table there and people would sit there, you know, they felt they could be kind of private and, you know, tutor or just work together on something. Um, so we took a larger study table that would accommodate um, people and also had a power outlet in it because there was an outlet into the wall, but people were like crawling under the table to, you know, put in their charging devices. And um, it was awkward. So we got a larger study table that we had elsewhere out on the floor and stuck it into that corner. And it, it maybe doesn't look the greatest, but it's, you know, it's more or less out of sight. And people are very comfortable there. They sit and they work. I, I always talk about um, the nurses who are constantly studying for some certification or some degree or other. And, you know, two or three of them will be there working together in that space. Um, and it's kind of private while being, you know, it's, it's not a hidden, you know, hidden uh, study room or anything. Um, so that's an example. Um, our reference desk is, we do not staff our reference desk. Um, so it's actually become an office area. And the reason why is we can see it really well from our circulation desk, um, which is also our, just our, our only service desk upstairs. Um, so it's right next to the public computers, it's where the public copier is, it's where the fax machine is. Um, we have some basic office supplies there. So we've created sort of that, you know, that little um, office area. The coffee corner um, is where we put our coloring area in the before times and people like mm -hmm. to sit there and color at the table. So little changes like that, yeah. Thank you. And Karen put a, a comment in the chat too, just that observations by staff are one of the best ways to collect info about changes needed. And Karen, you probably yeah. encountered that in your sort of design thinking um, process as well. Obviously you wanna to talk to your community and get feedback directly from them, but just those daily observations in the library, is that something that you used as well? Absolutely, yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, thank you both so much. I really appreciate it, Karen and Kate. I know you are open to any kind of emails and questions from uh, our attendees if, if there's any follow-up that they want to have with you. I did post our evaluation link in the chat. You'll be getting an email from Middletown's Library Service Center in about an hour with a request to fill out the evaluation for us. And also uh, I posted the link 
for where we're going to put our recording either later this afternoon or tomorrow. And that link will be in the email as well. So I'd like to thank our presenters today. Thank my coworker, Ashley, for um, minding the store. And thank you all for attending. I really appreciate your time. And we will see you again, hopefully in the future, maybe in person. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.